Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Provost Graduate Student Lecture Series. Um, I'm Chuck Tabor, the uh, Interim Dean of the Graduate School. Um, we've had this series for three years now. And in fact, this is the last uh, presentation of the third academic year that we've done the, the program. Um, I think it's been a really successful program. I've been to, I think, all but three of the lectures, and they've been just fantastic. I can tell you that the uh, the quality of the research that has been nominated for these lectures has, has just gone up uh, through the three years. Uh, we had, uh, I think, I think we, we did uh, 22 lectures this year, and that was out of a, a, a pool of about 80 nominations. And they were already self, you know, selected to be very strong nominations. Uh, so we're really getting the best uh, research that graduate students are doing at Stony Brook in these lecture series. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Danny Bluestein, uh, who's going to introduce Ted Kleiner, our speaker. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the presentation. Uh, most of you are familiar faces and uh, know that uh, pretty well. And uh, of course, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ted, who has kind of a bit untraditional uh, background in history as a graduate student. Uh, he uh, actually had a pretty long career previously uh, in service in the army uh, and uh, eventually uh, arrived uh, to study at uh, Florida International University. Uh, several of uh, my good colleagues and friends, uh, uh, Professor Richard uh, Schopweiser and uh, Professor Jimmy Moore in the past, and uh, eventually. Uh, decided to pursue his uh, graduate uh, studies uh, with uh, our uh, research group, and I'm uh, very glad that uh, that uh, chose us. And uh, since uh, his arrival, and uh, also uh, that was struggling with uh, all kind of uh, personal uh, uh, adversities, uh, that proved himself very accomplished uh, kind of uh, researcher and. Uh, very strong uh, initiation skills in order to conduct a study that has a lot of importance in terms of the uh, future of uh, healthcare and uh, suddenly people with severe uh, cardiovascular diseases, specifically uh, valvular heart uh, type of uh, diseases. And uh, the very unique uh, project that uh, some of you are pretty familiar uh, with uh, uh, working uh, together with that. Uh, is trying to develop uh, the kind of uh, what uh, they titled as the holy grail of uh, prosthetic heart. This is a polymer heart valve, something that uh, we've been chasing for the last uh, 40 years and uh, unfortunately not very successful. But uh, we have now very strong indications that uh, this is, uh, may become a clinical uh, viable uh, approach. And, this is uh, extremely important uh, given the fact that uh, we have now a new technique of implanting uh, prosthetic heart valves uh, without uh, necessitating or mandating uh, the kind of thoracic uh, surgery that uh, some of the patients that are either uh, too ill or uh, too elderly uh, to survive uh, such an operation. Uh, this is a true uh, life cycle. And uh, as you're going to see in uh, Ted's uh, presentation, uh, he'll uh, show you uh, the pathway or possible approach uh, how to solve this uh, very complex uh, problem. So, in fact, I'm turn the floor uh, to you and uh, lead us uh, through. Show us the light. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Bluestein. Thank you, uh, Dean Tabor. Thank you all for attending. Uh, as you can see, I've used the Holy Grail as an analogy for my work. And you see the iconic uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade uh, movie image. And he's holding there the Holy Grail, and supposedly the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper, and it has the power to heal. And so what do I mean by Holy Grail in this context? It's an object that is uh, sought after for its great significance. And it also represents a disruptive technology in the marketplace that can create a new market and displace uh, existing technology. Uh, 
And you see here Monty Python and the Holy Grail, another analogy of the project, because sometimes it can be a comical uh, farce in this quest. So to give you some background, if you're unfamiliar with the heart, uh, you can see here at the top right, uh, the heart is shown. And the four valves in the heart, there's four chambers, four valves. And beginning on the right side here, the uh, deoxygenated blood enters the heart to the right atrium, passes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, which is then pumped into the lungs for gas exchange, and uh, then returns to the left atrium, passing through the mitral valve into the muscular left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart, and then it, that pumps blood out through the aorta to the rest of the body and the tissues to deliver oxygenated blood and, and nutrients. And the aortic valve is the focus of my work, and the failure modes of that valve are stenosis and insufficiency. And uh, failure can lead to death, it's a, it's, so it's a very serious issue. So stenosis is a narrowing of the valve. You see here is a normal, healthy aortic valve. The leaflets are nice and smooth and the commissures are free. And over here you see uh, a diseased valve with the uh, calcific nodules here and here, and the commissures of the leaflets fused, and a very narrow opening. So this is what we're talking about. Insufficiency is a leaky valve, so it doesn't close properly and blood leaks back into the ventricle. Um, and then here you can see the complex structure of the leaflet. It's got uh, three distinct tissue layers and has a, a non-uniform uh, thickness. So from the uh, aortic surface is a collagen-rich uh, fibrosa that's kind of ridged. The center is a watery spongiosa, uh, a kind of a connective tissue, and the ventricular surface is a thin, elastin-rich uh, layer that allows the valve to stretch during closure. And here you can see uh, how the collagen fibers are arranged in the circumferential direction to bear the load of diastolic pressure load, and that's the, the load it bears when it closes. And the circumferential direction is across this way, and this way is the radial direction. So to give some background on prosthetic heart valves, uh, the first uh, prosthetic heart valve was implanted in 1952 at Georgetown University by Dr. Charles Huffnagel. You can see that it was a plastic tube with a ball in it. It was sutured into the uh, descending aorta. And this was before the invention of the heart-lung bypass machine, which was uh, uh, used uh, first in the human in 1953. So that ushered in the era of open heart surgery. So when that began is when prosthetic heart valves were able to be used because the heart could be arrested and drained of blood and opened while keeping the patient alive. So uh, this is an interesting uh, thing to note, uh, early collaborations between engineers and physicians. So Lowell Edwards was a uh, retired hydraulics engineer with several patents on hydraulic systems and uh, aircraft from World War II. And he was retired and started a laboratory and was working on an artificial heart. So he went up to the University of Oregon and he found a young Dr. Albert Starr who was just starting his uh, cardiac surgery uh, program. And he said, you know, let's collaborate on an artificial heart. And Dr. Starr says, well, wait a minute, we don't have the technology for that. We can't even replace heart valves yet. So Dr. Starr said, why don't you make a prosthetic heart valve instead? And they invented together the very first uh, implantable prosthetic heart valve here, the ball and cage valve which was used for many decades. And then next along the line, you see the Burke shiley valve in 1969, and then finally a bileaflet mechanical valve in 79. And these are all mechanical heart valves that require the patient to be anticoagulated. So they have to take a drug called warfarin, and uh, this is a vitamin K dependent uh, pathway in the coagulation system, so the patient's diet can affect their level of anticoagulation. And uh, so they have to be monitored their whole life while they take this drug. But these things are very durable, so they usually last the lifetime of the patient. This is the most popular design now. So pe people uh, realized not everybody could take anticoagulants, so they came up with uh, a valve that didn't require that. And the very first one was Dr. Donald Ross in the UK, came up with a surgical procedure to implant a cadaver donated frozen aortic valve into a patient which was the first uh, tissue valve. And then 
an engineer by the name of Warren Hancock uh, came up with the first stented porcine valve, which was an animal valve, uh, the first animal valve used in humans. So he also came up with the process of pre preserving these tissues uh, for use as uh, prostheses. And it's interesting that both Hancock and Shelley used to work at Edwards and they spun off their own businesses. And then later, Edwards and uh, Alain Carpentier in France collaborated to create this uh, bovine pericardial heart valve. And the pericardium is the sac that surrounds the heart. So they took out sections of tissues and preserved it and sewed it into the stent like this. So 76 and 79, basically these two designs are still used today. 30 years later, we have the most significant change in prosthetic heart valves uh, called transcatheter valve replacement. So in this case, the valve can be placed inside of a catheter about the size of a pencil and inserted into a peripheral artery and threaded up into the heart and the valve can be deployed over the uh, disease valve. And this was first conceptualized in 1965 and then later, uh, Dr. Henning Anderson over in Denmark came up with the idea of this uh, stented porcine valve that could be deployed from a catheter. And he came up with that in 1989, did the studies, and it turns out that nobody wanted to publish his work. They thought the idea was crazy, that it wasn't going to work, and it took him until 92 to get it published. So after that was published, a whole uh, a lot of interest was generated in this technology. And the two most successful guys were Philip Bonhoeffer in the UK and Alain Cribier in France, and these have become FDA approved in, in the United States in the last two years. This one is for uh, aortic valve replacement. So in terms of polymer valves, uh, Dr. Nina Brunwald was the first one to invent a bileaflet uh, polymeric valve to replace the mitral valve. And you can see there are Teflon tethers to suture those uh, to the base of the ventricle. It's interesting to note she was also the first female heart surgeon. And this was the first and only uh, polymer valve, flexible polymeric valve implanted in a human being. And that was 1960. So since 1960 until now, nobody has gotten a valve like this, a trileaflet flexible polymeric valve into the clinic. And that's why it's a, sort of a holy grail quest because it seems so daunting. So who's gonna make the next uh, transition? Uh, we don't know yet, but we think it might be, you know, we're pretty close. So why do we want polymer valves when we have tissue and mechanical valves? Well, if you look at this chart here, uh, it shows lifetime risk versus age at implantation. And the gray bars are reoperation risk of tissue valves. The black bar is the reoperation risk of mechanical valves. And you can see at a young age, there's a high reoperation risk that goes down in tissue valves, but the mechanical valves is flat no matter when they're implanted. And here, the, the solid line is bleeding risk for mechanical valves. The dashed line is bleeding risk for tissue valves. It's flat for tissue valves no matter when it's implanted, but it increases for mechanical valves. So we want to combine these two features, flat, bleeding risk and flat reoperation risk in the one device to, to eliminate anticoagulants and structural valve deterioration. I failed to mention that tissue valves don't last as long as mechanical because they're not living tissue, they can't repair themselves, and they can't maintain calcium homeostasis. And then also here you see the dashed line is the trend in open heart procedures since 1995. It's been about flat. And then the red arrow is pointing to the line for percutaneous interventions, that's catheter-based interventions. It's been increasing since about 1990. So the goals of this project are to uh, design a new polymer heart valve in the virtual domain and use our uh, device thrombogenicity emulation method to optimize it, and then fabricate prototypes, test them on the bench, and complete an optimization cycle and assess the feasibility of a novel uh, polymer called Exibs. So the device thrombogenicity emulation methodology is really the bread and butter of our lab, the subject of a very large uh, grant from the NIH awarded to Professor Bluestein.
and it combines uh, numerical and experimental techniques and basically it's an optimization tool and their overarching goal of this method is to alleviate patients from anticoagulation. So you see here we start with uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics, numerical studies, finite element analysis, fluid structure interaction. And we can simulate platelets going through the, the device and select in certain regions uh, platelet trajectories that are of interest that we think might uh, cause platelet activation, which leads to thrombosis. Then we can extract those, plot the stress versus time of that trajectory, program it into this hemodynamic sharing device. Uh, use freshly isolated human platelets and then run our platelet activation state assay. And briefly, the, uh, the assay uh, measures thrombin generation from a platelet that, that's activated by shear stress and uh, expresses anionic phospholipids. Then the prothrombinase complex conjugates on the surface and allows prothrombin to convert to thrombin, which coagulates fibrinogen to fibrin and is the basis of a blood clot. So what we have here is a defective uh, prothrombin or an acetylated prothrombin that creates a defective thrombin that can't coagulate fibrin and it can't feed back and further activate platelets. So we get a one-to-one -one relationship between shear stress and thrombin generation. So uh, briefly to go over medical device development, uh, we start with the user needs. In this case, the user is the patient and the uh, physician. And the physician basically wants a safe and effective device that's easy to use, and the patient wants uh, something that's going to alleviate their symptoms and uh, improve their quality of life. And then from that, we extract specific design inputs, go through a design process, and get an output, and then perform verification testing. And this uh, inner loop is where we're at right now. And uh, once verification testing works, or proves itself out, we have a medical device that goes through validation testing where we test that it meets the user end needs all along the way, reviewing the process. So here are my design inputs for um, our design inputs for the tissue valve. It's a uh, 19 millimeter internal diameter, which is about a 21 millimeter tissue annulus diameter. We chose that because it's the smallest human size and it also fits in the animal model. We want a homogeneous polymer. We want thrombogenic footprint less than or equal to tissue. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We want uh, platelet activation less than or equal to a tissue valve. And then these standards come from the regulatory agencies. Minimum of five years durability on the bench, uh, an effective orifice area, uh, one square millimeter, pressure gradient 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, regurgitation fraction 5% and jet velocity and forward flow less than 2 meters per second. So we're studying a polymer called cross-sibs or X-sibs and it's based on the polymer SIBS which is a polystyrene isobutylene tri-block copolymer and it's composed of a glassy styrene segment and a rubbery isobutylene segment so it has properties that overlap polyurethane and silicone rubber and this is in a class of super biostable polymers. It's hydrolytically, enzymatically, and oxidatively stable. And there's no evidence of in vivo degradation, embrittlement, or calcification so far, significant, no significant foreign body reactions, low platelet activation and adhesion. And it, it's been commercialized by Boston Scientific in a coronary stent that looks paclitaxel. Uh, a drug to prevent uh, reclosure of a stenosis in the coronary artery. It's also being used for ophthalmological devices by Novia, and it's also been tried for uh, percutaneous heart, I mean, uh, polymer heart valves. And uh, Anovia has formulated a new uh, formulation called XSIBS that's thermally crosslinked. So SIBS is a thermoplastic elastomer, XSIBS is a thermoset. Uh, that can't be undone once it's created. And we expect increased durability and reduced viscoelastic creep. So our initial experience with uh, the SIBS Dacron mesh uh, composite design uh, showed us a few things that we need to change. And uh, you can see the SIBS had an embedded uh, polyester mesh to give it mechanical strength. As I said, it's a thermoplastic and it had low tensile strength. 
So basically sieves is used as a biocompatible coating on the uh, polyester mesh. And you can see the prototype here, designed as an open heart and plantable valve. And the bench top results looked good, so they used it in sheep. They put it in the sheep and then it failed. And the reason it failed is here, you can see the viscoelastic creep of the polymer. And you see these arrows are pointing to cracks. That's not from <coughs> excuse me, degradation, it's from the polymer pulling itself apart over time. And that allowed uh, the blood elements to infiltrate and attack the uh, polyester mesh. And then finite element analysis showed that uh, there was high stress concentrations in diastole, in the belly, on the leaflet free edge. And in parallel, we developed a transcatheter design, you can see here, that's collapsible into a, a, a catheter and deployable into the heart and prove the feasibility of that design. So learning from that experience, uh, we moved on to a new design. So here's the old geometry with some key uh, geometric features pointed out, commissure region, coaptation, excuse me, coaptation area, leaflet belly, the profile of the valve, and the stent. You can see the original uh, uh, composite design. And what we've done is changed the shape of the leaflet from a sort of a collapsing cylinder to a hemispherical design, and then changed the leaflet thickness at key locations in the valve. So on the edge, it's thick, 250 microns, and it thins down and then gets thicker again in the belly, thins down again and then thick at the, uh, the base. We also kicked out the stent posts. See, these are straight. These are tilted out a little bit to increase the exit orifice. So since uh, XSIBS is a new polymer, we had to get some mechanical properties for numerical studies. So we performed tensile testing on sheets we created and uh, got the data, input that into finite element analysis, redid the tensile test in finite element analysis, and found that uh, non, or the uh, hyperelastic uh, material model matched well with the uh, experimental data. So using that information, we moved on to uh, finite element analysis of uh, a diastolic pressure load, 80 millimeters of mercury on three designs, the tissue valve here, uh, is sort of the control valve. We got this geometry from micro CT scans performed on the tissue valve. Here's the original SIBS Dacron composite, and here's the optimized design. All the scales are the same in each image. So what you see, the red areas are high stresses. In the tissue valve, you have high stresses in the commissures that spread across the leaflet and also down the belly, but there's low stress in the free edge. In the composite valve, you see high stresses in the, in the commissures that spread all the way across the free edge, down through the belly, and then the base. And in the optimized design, you see much lower stresses in the commissures, a much more even stress distribution across the belly, and very low stresses on the free edge. So uh, here you see just the uh, analysis of the full cardiac cycle pressure gradient load and structural finite element analysis in three designs. This is a tissue valve on the top. This is a polyurethane valve from Aortec here. And this is the SIBS uh, composite valve. Here's a video of the SIBS uh, transcatheter valve in our left heart simulator. And we did this just to illustrate the effect of the ge geometrical changes on the opening and closing and the stress distributions. They all behave differently, but the, you can see the FEA doesn't exactly match <clears throat> the uh, reality of the valve opening and closing at this point. So here we have uh, two-phase com computational fluid dynamics, and this is uh, particle dispersion videos. So two-phase meaning particle and fluid, and the particles represent platelets. They're three micron spheres. And we see about 30,000 particles upstream of the valve. These are turbulent simulations. And you can see the platelets coming through the valve, and each uh, particle distribution looks different based on the geometry. We use uh, a decelerating systolic uh, velocity waveform. And you can see, uh, looking at the maximum velocity and pressure gradient that the optimized valve in this case has the lowest. 
and we see all these interesting recirculation zones and, and coalescing of the uh, particles and how they move differently through the valves. And then here you see regurgitative flow. So these valves are in the uh, diastolic phase. You see the velocity is constant. This is, these are laminar flow uh, simulations, unsteady. And the valves are not exactly watertight. There's small gaps at the uh, commissures and in the center. And you can see how the particles come through the valves differently in each design and, and four jets and they coalesce downstream in different ways. And you look at the maximum velocity and that is highest in the uh, original composite design. So we take all that information from the uh, particles, the 30,000 particles. We calculate the stress at each point along the way as they pass through the, the device and sum that up and then we get the stress accumulation for each particle trajectory and then plot that in the uh, probability density function you see here. And we've smoothed that out with kernel smoothing to give us some nice curves. And this is what we call the thrombogenic footprint. So the blue line is the optimized valve. The top graph is the regurgitant flow. And you can see what we look at are the modes of the curve. And we have two modes here. The first mode are the particles, the platelets trapped upstream of the valve that didn't pass through it in the regurgitant phase because it's closed. The second peak are the particles that went through the valve. And you can see the peak shifted to the left means that the majority of the particles reside in a low stress accumulation zone. And here the uh, optimized valve is furthest to the left. And as also in the forward flow, the optimized valve has a high narrow peak and a very low stress accumulation zone compared to the other two valves. So we could say the thrombogenic footprint indicates that the, that the optimized valve has an advantage over the original design and the tissue valve. So moving on to the experimental section of the DTE, uh, we have the hemodynamic shearing device, which is a programmable cone plate wet viscometer. And we put freshly isolated human platelets in there and we emulate the waveforms we extract from uh, CFD. Uh, at key locations, like I said, the commissure, the center, we have three commissures, and then we plot those stress versus time waveforms, program them into the HSD. And here you can see the uh, composite design, open valve waveforms, and the optimized waveforms. And these, X -X, or these Y axis scales are the same. So we have much more dynamic uh, waveforms from the old design and less dynamic from the new design, so we expect lower platelet activation. So here's the platelet activation results. This is uh, the change in platelet activation state from beginning to end of the experiment for three valves. And you can see the optimizes in red and it's very low compared to the original composite and the tissue. And over here you see representative uh, trajectories from the original design. And likewise uh, in the regurgitant flow, you see in the center trajectories, they're all about the same, which is interesting. But when you get to the trajectories at the commissures, the original design is very much more activating. And if you look at the cross section of the velocity vector map here, this shows the uh, commissure region. You have a high velocity jet that extends far down the wall here. And so these platelets get trapped in that jet and get a higher stress accumulation. Whereas the other ones get entrained more towards the core and uh, feel a lower stress accumulation and lower velocity flow. So we also do fluid structure interaction studies uh, because we can and because, <laughs> because it uh, is a more accurate uh, representation of, of reality because we have the fluid and solid phases together, which makes sense. Um, we're working on getting the platelets in there as well. So we'll have all three elements of the uh, numerical phase into one system. But until that happens, we have initial fluid structure interaction studies where you see this is the fluid grid. You see the elements it's expanding in between the leaflets and compressing behind the leaflets. This is the original composite design. An isometric view, the flow going this way, 
and you can see the uh, path lines coming through. Those are not particles in this situation. And then here you see the velocity uh, profiles. And over here in behind the valve, you can see they're kind of blunted, so that it's not fully developed flow, which is what we would expect. And then beyond the valve, the strong jet. And here's the solid phase. Uh, you can see the stress is developing as the flow moves forward, and the stresses are highest near the commissures. And here you have the optimized valve geometry in three different views, also FSI. And uh, up here you see the stress is developing in the solid phase during forward flow. This is the top view and the bottom view. You can see the pressure gradient loading here increasing to a maximum during uh, systole. Over here you see the pressure gradient building behind the valve uh, as, it's forced, as the fluid is forcing the valve open. And here you see the velocity vectors developing and they're entrained towards the core flow away from the wall. So once we've done all this stuff in the virtual domain, we have to move to reality and create prototypes. And this is the next step. So we've uh, designed, uh, using CAD, a uh, very precise um, compression molding system. Uh, using heat and compression, we come out with a valve like this, using uh, the novel polymer. And once we have the prototype, we test it in our uh, Vivitro left heart simulator. It's a very accurate uh, simulator of the left heart, and you can see it's got the, all the components of the left side of the heart, the ventricle, the atrium, the aorta, and then compliance chambers and resistors, so we, all those things can be tuned so that we get very precise physiologic waveforms. And here you see the uh, transcatheter valve from the top view and the side view in that system pumping away. So here are some hydrodynamics results that we get from that system. So we get pressure gradient during forward flow as a function of mean forward flow rate. And comparing the composite design to tissue, you can see that they're very close. And this, is, this should be an increasing, uh, almost linear function here. And then we have regurgitation as a function of cardiac output. And you can see also the tissues, the triangles, the composite designs, the circles, they're very close. And as the designs improve, they get closer to the control valve and pressure gradient, regurgitative fraction, and uh, effective orifice area. So then we can go on to durability testing on the bench. Uh, with this vitro high cycle system, we can place six valves in there and simulate about five years of use in four months at 20 hertz. That's about two, 200 million cycles with a back pressure of 125 millimeters of mercury. And then finally, the uh, bulk flow platelet activation studies in our left ventricular assist device, which is driven by a pulsatile pump. Uh, we mount the valves in custom designed uh, valve holders and fill this thing up with uh, platelet buffer and platelet, human platelets, and pump it around for 30 minutes at 5 liters a minute. We have a custom designed compliance tubing to connect the two chambers. And we've already compared the composite design to tissue. And what we see in the platelet activation rate is a five fold difference in the polymer versus the tissue. So the polymer is five times less activating than the tissue valve. And we compared that to a, a more standardized test, uh, a piece selected in flow cytometry, and the results agreed. So what we can say is that the polymer valve that we have probably won't require any coagulation. So in summary, uh, we have a new polymeric art valve that we've created. Uh, we have new intellectual property that's been disclosed. We completed one optimization cycle. Uh, our DT method has been verified in trilief with PHVs, and uh, we verified uh, the performance of the prototypes, and hopefully we've moved these valves closer to clinical viability. So next steps, we're going to assess the level of optimization, possibly complete more optimization cycles, apply for a small business innovation grant, spin off a commercial venture in the Long Island High Technology Incubator, strengthen our IP with more data, and then move into animal trials, apply for investigational device exemption, and then finally on to clinical trials and pre-market approval, always keeping in mind that failure is always an option.
So I'd like to acknowledge all the people involved in this project. It took a lot of help to do this work. Uh, the funding from the NIH, the very large uh, quantum grant given to Professor, awarded to Professor Bluestein, uh, our collaborators in our department, Professor Udex, Professor Lieber, and their students, Ronak and Joe and Shika, uh, the Helmholtz Institute of Applied Medical Engineering in Aachen, Germany, Professor Steinseifer and his uh, employee Maximilian Kuting, uh, Anovia LLC, who provides the uh, cross sibs, Lynn Pinchuk and Yusushi Kato are the polymer experts, uh, Dr. Slepian at the Sarver Center, the Sarver Heart Center at the University of Arizona. He's a cardiologist and serial entrepreneur. He's been really valuable to the project. And then, our, of course, our illustrious lab members, uh, former members who've helped out, Dr. Gridar, Dr. Zenos, uh, students, Philip Chu, Chow Gao, postdocs, uh, Yard Alamu, Sheila George, Jawad Sharif, Joao Suarez, and our FSI expert, Dinesh Peter. With that, thank you. I'll take questions.